life. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Very excited for this episode. It's been another big week in markets. Um, It's been another big week in your life, um, and I'm excited to unpack it all today. Yeah, well, um, I'm looking forward to understanding what you think has been going on in my life, but sure. (laughs) (laughs) So today we're going to have a bit of a chinwag around what's going on with US inflation. Some data's just come through. Uh, We're going to speak about two of the greatest investors you've never heard of. And spoiler alert, they're not you and I. (laughs) That's true, (laughs) yes. Uh, But Ren, you wanted to start off with some good news and bad news for me. Yeah, Bryce. uh, Obviously, (laughs) it's been a big week for you and... um, you know, there's there's always you got to take the good with the bad. So where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the bad news or the good news? Start with the good news. All right. Well, Bryce, the good news is that your honeymoon is back on <laughs> because cruise lines are back in business, baby. <laughs> I do not pay cruise ships. <laughs> so uh, Carnival Cruise announced earlier this month that the week uh, that they had the biggest one week booking in their 50 year history. That's big. That is big. Yeah. So, look, it's good news for you and uh, Ham and congratulations to the two of you. Can't (laughs) wait to hear about the honeymoon. But more generally, it's good news because the world's reopening. Like, cruise ships were sort of the canary in the coal mine for for COVID. And now they're the canary out of the coal mine. I wonder what their policies are, though. If you get COVID on board, do you just isolate in your room? I guess so. Yeah, or you take the Australian government approach and just don't tell anyone else. (laughs) I guess that's good news for those that enjoy cruising, Ren. That is not me, unfortunately, or well, that is not me yet, and maybe later in life. But for now, um, I'm not a cruise kind of guy. Yeah, I'm interested because people kept trying to get in on the Carnival cruise and the Norwegian cruise, all the stocks that were trading, and... I don't. I think a lot of people pulled the trigger too early. I haven't seen how their share prices have gone. Um, not a class of in, in. They say invest in what you know, and you could take that a f- step further. Invest in what you love, and it's probably not something that we're investing in. Yeah. Well, since um, two thousand and twenty, early twenty twenty, when the stock plummeted, so third of March twenty twenty, third of April twenty twenty was its low. It's actually own. It's up one hundred and twenty nine percent since then. Were you about to say only one hundred twenty nine percent? Yeah. This year though, it's um. This year, Carnival. This is Carnival Court, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Um. It's pretty flat, down three percent this year. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. So that's the good news, Bryce. I guess now we have to turn to the bad news for you. Hit me. R M Williams are changing their boots. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, this is a Twiggy Forest story that I really just wanted to talk about. And they may not be changing. They may just be adding. But um, Twiggy Forest uh, bought RM Williams in yep. 2020. For people who are unfamiliar with who Twiggy is, uh, he is the chair of Fortescue, um, the one of Australia's big iron ore miners. Well, one of the world's big iron ore miners. Um, he's a billionaire many times over. And he is very innovative. Um, Comedian v. Economist, uh, one of our fellow podcasts here at Equity Mates, labelled him Elon Musk's dad. (laughs) And I think there's they've got some uh, there's some merit there. Um, But R. M. Williams. So uh, Twiggy's investment company recently invested in a U.S. plant-based textile manufacturer, uh, Natural Fiber Welding, and um, they're. They basically said, well, the quote is, whilst RM Williams will always be at its core a leather boot company, consumers are looking for different options and this could allow us to produce a 100% plant-based boot as an alternative. Got to respect that. Um, Doesn't sound like they'll replace the leather boots, Mm. but you're right, maybe a new product line, plant-based boot. Is it something that you'll be getting in on? Yeah, I'm a forward-thinking ethical kind of guy, so absolutely. (laughs) Fair enough. Love to see it. Um, the thing is, RMs are so good that they last so long that I, I just you just don't need another pair. 
It's like the whole problem with buying a new car now that it's going to have like 15 years or 20 years of internal combustion engine light. Yeah, you okay. don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Twiggy being uh, Elon Musk's dad. So Twiggy, I think, is going to go down as like the greatest entrepreneur of... He's not really our generation, is he? Of our parents' generation, I guess? I think one of, yeah. He's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. so... Fortescue's cost curve, like the way that they reduce their uh, cost of per ton of iron ore is, yeah. is pretty incredible. Um, we did a company deep dive a while ago where we spoke about it. Mm. Uh, it's worth pulling that chart out. Um, have you heard about his ele- his three kilometer electric train? Yeah, I was. we were chatting about it a couple of days ago. Yeah, yeah. so uh, basically... He's building a three-kilometer train with all this with a Formula One a Formula One company. He's building it for him. Williams is that one? Yeah, that's one. It could be them. I'd be surprised because they're the worst team. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe they're looking to <laughs> diversify. Keep, anyway, keep chatting. Anyway. I'll Google it. No, no, it's not that important. Anyway, so they're building a three-kilometer-long train that's basically going to roll iron ore down the hill to the port, and it's going to use the kinetic energy it generates from braking as it rolls down the hill to then. Um, basically power the batteries to get it back up the hill. Wow. You're right. It's Williams. Williams Advanced Engineering. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That yeah, is yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he uh, is obviously running ahead with hydrogen mm-hmm. um, to the point where he made an ad that challenged other billionaires to get on board to chase him yeah. because he was it was too easy at the moment. He was yeah. just taking his pick of all the best opportunities. <laughs> yeah. So very forward thinking there. Um, Sun Cable, have you heard of this? Yes. So he and Mike Cannon Brooks, uh, who is the Atlassian co CEO and co founder, are funding a, I think it's 4,000 kilometer long undersea cable from the north of Australia to Singapore. Mm. And then they're building one of the biggest solar farms uh, in the north of Australia. And they plan to provide 20% of Singapore's power from a solar. Uh, farm in the north of Australia. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, like that. Th- these are like maybe they're not quite Elon Musk level electric cars and r- uh, reusable rockets, um, but they're very impressive. I'm um, what I yeah. So Fortescue has bought Williams Advanced Engineering. Oh really? Yeah, but I don't know. No. Yeah, he has. It says Williams Advanced Engineering acquired by FMG for two hundred and twenty million, January two thousand and twenty-two. But I don't think we need to just draw the lines of how that relates to the to the F one. Uh, it is. Yeah, Williams has been sold to Fortescue. In a, anyway, so Fortescue own an F one team? Well, no, Ren, not quite. As I understand it, he owns the 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 battery arm, which is Williams Advanced Engineering of the Williams racing group right something along those lines anyway williams grand prairie engineering is the williams racing group and then there's williams in advanced engineering which fortescue owns and i'm sure there's some sort of collaboration going on but he doesn't own the racing team as okay such. Yeah. anyway anyway I'm... that's what you can do as a billionaire just buy heaps of things well we often <laughs> speak about that billionaires don't have enough fun with their money he's having a lot of fun. he's having and a lot good of fun good fun yeah. yeah um and the most recent thing he's done they he's bought uh, 8% of the ship be- shipbuilder, Austell. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know what what the go is there, but um, that'll be an interesting one to watch. Um, but the Iron Williams thing was really just a vehicle for us to talk about some of the crazy stuff Twiggy's doing because it's, um, it's impressive and it's exciting. Yeah, and we do have an open invite to Twiggy on our show at any time. So I'm feeling this is the year that it happens, but let's let's see. Fingers if we just crossed. keep pumping his tires up like yeah, this, exactly. maybe it'll happen exactly. at some point. Anyway, Ren, moving. Hold on. Maybe we ask if we can jump in the three-kilometer train and go with Twiggy down the hill. <laughs> no, not bad. <laughs> but let's move on. US inflation data. It's come out, Ren, and it's come out hot. 8.4% is the latest figure, and that is a 41-year high. Prices continue to go up at an astonishing rate. It's up 1.2 percentage points from last month, and this is the highest month-to-month jump since 2005. Yep. Now, this is the US, yes. this should be clear, yep. um, but the drivers in the US are likely also to affect uh, inflation around the world, the main one being 
petrol prices. Petrol prices, we've seen it here in Australia at the pump, so much so that uh, in the recent federal budget, it was such a pain point that the Australian government halved the ta- uh, petrol uh, excise, and uh, there's no doubt that it was um, seriously hitting the pockets of, of many people. But also food and housing costs over in the States are driving inflation, um, and we're, we're also seeing seeing that here in Australia as well. So... Um, core inflation, which excludes food and energy prices, has increased 6.5%. So still pretty significant increase there. Um, this is coupled, though, with a pretty strong US economy. Um, record high job openings and unemployment is dipping to a 50-year low. So we're also seeing that here in Australia. Unemployment about 4%. Expected to I mean, hit- you've done better than Albo. <laughs> yes, expected to hit 3.75 or thereabouts, which would be, I think, a 40-year low. Um, or has it happened? Yeah, something something similar to that. So, yeah, it's a very interesting dynamic at the moment and uh, one that we certainly need to, to keep a close eye on. Yeah, there were a few economists that, uh, when this number came out, were in the media saying this is going to be the high point. Uh, like forward-looking indicators say that um, we should start to see inflation plateau and then we'll be cycling these numbers next year. But honestly, like fool me once, uh, or that fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Um, that was, Those same economists were saying that this was going to be transitory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember yeah, speaking yeah. to a number of investors as well who made investment decisions off the back of this being purely transitory and just dust brushed this off. So, yeah. yeah. So, I think for me, there's a lot of noise created by macro headlines, but it's like you just, no one knows. Yeah, no one knows. Yeah. Um, so, I'm not going to spend a lot of time thinking about it. We, um, we tweeted out a sign that uh, we came across uh, on Twitter um, that Chipotle had a sign in their window, current prices on our menu do not reflect updated prices. We apologize for any inconvenience. Uh, we're currently waiting for new signs to be printed. When prices are rising quicker than signs can be printed. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, a burrito's now 660. Oh no, 670. <laughs> there um I guess the, the question, you know, this is an investing podcast. We're trying to figure out how to invest on the back of it. Um, There was another podcast that I was listening to that were talking about the perils of trying to invest uh, on the back of it, like use inflation as a reason to like short uh, the market or anything like that. Um, They use the example of Zimbabwe, which I know is an extreme example. But in 2008, Zimbabwe got crushed with hyperinflation. And if you were like, you know, the currency is getting weaker and the stock market is going to follow... And just taking a really conservative short position, a 2% short position. Um, While the currency was getting decimated, the stock market went up 500 times in local currency terms or 50 times in US dollar terms. And that means your 2% short position would have wiped your whole portfolio out. After that, the stock market then basically went to zero. So you were right, um, but you would have lost a lot of money or you would have lost all your money on the way. Yeah, everything. and I guess I, I, they didn't explain why the market shot up so much, but I guess it's because people were just trying to get out of cash into any asset possible. Um, and I, yeah, uh, mm. and I guess a- anyway, I, I think it was just it was an interesting example because there's been a lot of headlines about inflation. And it's like, well, how do you play this? What do you invest in? Like, what's the what's the portfolio positioning? And listening to that story, I was just like. You Sack don't play it. it. You just yeah, find just, good companies yeah, yeah. that have pricing power yeah. that can, uh, you know, survive Withstand through this, this yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. inflation cycle. And you know, we this this like everything will pass. Yeah. You know, inflation has been bad before, and it will be bad again. I think people who start saying it's like the Weimar Republic in Germany or Zimbabwe just need to relax a little bit. (laughs) We've gone from like a decade pre-COVID of no one being able to get any inflation in the system to now having a lot of inflation very quickly. But, um, you know, it's let's just take a deep breath, find good companies or just, you know, Put your head in the sand. Stick to your investing strategy if that's <laughs> yeah. index funds or whatever it is. Just 
just everyone relax. <laughs> <laughs> Especially you've headline heard headline writers. You've heard it here first. <laughs> everyone relax. So, Ren, I did mention at the top of the episode that we're going to uh, have a chat about two uh, of the greatest investors you may n- never have heard of. And we are going to get to that on the other side of this break. But before we do, really exciting news. The latest podcast in the Equity Mates Media stable is The Dive, and it launches on Wednesday. We've put in a, a lot of hard yards to get to this point, and we're turning business news on its head, delivering it in the Equity Mates way. Yeah, so if you want to know what that means, head over to The Dive. The first episode is released this Wednesday. So depending on when you're listening to this, it may be out in a couple of days or it may already be out. Uh, But head over, listen to the trailer, listen to the episodes if they're out. Um, Give us a review. Um, It really does help us in the charts early days if you subscribe listen rate review tell your friends re-listen re-listen when you go to sleep cue all the episodes up and play them overnight um, that's it the early days especially on apple podcasts um give you a chance to hit the charts and we'd love your help to do that that's it so who says business news needs to be all business head over and subscribe now all right ren two great investors you've never heard of we've yes. heard of we've heard of buffett and charlie yep We've heard of Ackman and Ackman and and Bill. (laughs) We've we've heard of Kathy Wood. Goros, yes. What did you say? (laughs) Soros Soros and and Goros. Goros. You haven't heard of Goros? (laughs) Told you. Told you you never heard of him. (laughs) Jesus. Um, But have you heard of Nomad Partnership? uh, Well, yeah, I have. (laughs) Um, So Nick Sleep and Kai Zach Zachariah are the two investors that we're talking about today. And the reason that we're talking about them is because they absolutely crushed the market when they were in there, number <laughs> one. It. Number two, they got out when they had enough money. They <laughs> I, had, I hope they did. They had a number. Well, you know, Buffett's at $90 billion. Yeah, like, yeah. how much money do you need, mate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's got um, more than, I thought, yeah, anyway, keep going. Well, he's got more than that. I think so. I think he's in the Hungy B. But anyway, anyway. Te- 90, 100, same stuff, yeah. no, same thing. Yeah. What, what, like the marginal benefit of no, moving yeah. from 90 Zero. billion to 100 billion. Zero. Um, and they wrote some of the best investor letters going around is the third reason. And um, a lot of people haven't heard of their names. Um, so we thought we'd talk about them and some of the key lessons from their partnership letters. We will also include a link to all of the partnership letters that they published to, for free in the show notes so you can open that and read them um but i think let's start with where they ended which they wrote a letter to warren buffett um when they decided they were going to wrap up the partnership and it includes this paragraph which i think really sums up a lot about investing It appears to all the world that the performance that nomad has enjoyed over the years was created by zach and me This is not the case. As time goes by, the performance that our clients have received is the capitalization or the success of the firms in which we have invested. In other words, the real work is done by you and the good people at Berkshire. Nice. Which is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... The hard yards are done on the inside of the firm. think, Think about every great investor that we laud their returns. I mean, Buffett himself, you know. His returns are just a culmination of yeah. Tim Cook's work at Apple and yeah. um, a number of his privately held companies, his insurance team, mm. um, you know, back in the day, the um, the Catherine Grahams of the Washington Post and I have no idea who Amex's CEO was um, over the journey, but whoever ran Amex as Buffett held for decades, um, it's a good reminder. It is a good reminder, yeah. It's something that I've actually... It's good to come to front of mind because it yeah it does really sum up the investing game quite well. Yeah, yeah. And everyone, yeah, you know, uh, I was about to name a whole bunch more investors and the CEO, <laughs> but uh, you get the point. So, Ren, you mentioned that uh, Nick and Kai absolutely crushed the market. Yeah. They were in operation from 2001 to 2014. Yeah. To what degree did they actually crush the market? Well, uh they 10 x their partner's money while the MSCI World Index would have doubled the money. Love to see that. Yeah. Uh, so, to put numbers to it, 921% return in that time before fees compared to 117% for the MSCI All World Index. 
um, so 10x they double. Um, after fees, that works out. They returned 18.4% a year after fees and the MSCI World Index did 6.5%. Wow, they took a lot of fees. What do you mean? Well, that's only three times, but they've... Okay, yeah, I get it. But three times yeah. a year over, yeah, over 14 four, years yeah. compound. Yeah. <laughs> what was their number? Do you know? You said they, they hit their number and left. I don't think they ever said what the number was. Right. But they basically like, they did... got to the point we They won. did 13 years. Oh, they're probably billionaires. They're doing a, lot of, doing a lot of charitable stuff now. Um, but yeah, they had a number and they got out. Wow. So the link to all of the letters are in the show notes. But let's talk about some of the key things that we've taken from the letters. The first is the, around the joy of investing. And here's, here's a quote that they've pulled out, that we've pulled out. There are perhaps few things finer than the pleasure of finding out something new. Discovery is one of the joys of life and in our opinion is one of the real thrills of the investment process. I love this. I feel like we've spoken about this a couple of times, particularly on Get Started Investing, that when you really get into the get into the game of investing it definitely opens up your eyes to things that you would never otherwise be researching and reading and and be becoming interested in and there is real enjoyment and i think that's where a lot you and i particularly get a lot of enjoyment out of the the process of discovery yeah discovering yeah. just so much like later this week you'll hear an episode that we've done um in partnership with Stake around the future of an industry. We're doing uh, three episodes on the future of different industries. And just being able to just learn yeah. is just yeah. so exciting. Mm. And investing in some ways is just a way to monetize your learning. Mm. Monetize, <laughs> monetize your, your monetize curiosity. Your curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and these guys definitely monetize their curiosity um a big thing that they were so they came out of the buffett school of you know buying a dollar for 50 cents yeah um but then they came across what many people think is the best business of all time costco yeah okay and they fell in love with this idea of scale economics and they they dubbed this term scale economics shared and basically what they fell in love with costco why they fell in love with costco was costco as they grew uh, they didn't take more of the margin for themselves instead they shared it with their customers for lower prices and that creates a moat that is incredibly hard mm -hmm. to break because um they actually have this quote uh that uh, they ask, you know, what is it about growth stocks that dooms them to failure? Um, the answer is that the success encourages competition and capital flows into an industry to compete away the excess returns. That's the simple way of understanding um, competitive dynamics of an industry. But basically, they then asked, what if the excess returns weren't kept by the company in, and they were actually returned to... The customers, oh, no, customers. the customers. Then there are no excess returns to compete away. Then you build a real competitive advantage because businesses that are starting up don't have the scale, um, and so they're starting from a point of higher prices. And it's not like they can come in and compete your margin away. Um, they come in and they can't compete with you on price. Yeah, right. And so that was the Costco model that they fell in love with, um, and then they found Amazon. <laughs> and what happened to Amazon? Well, Amazon is the the quintessential example yeah. of um, a company that is scaled economics shared. Yeah. Um, and it's funny they actually in an early letter they actually asked the hypothetical question: What characteristics could one bestow on a company that would make it the most valuable in the world? Okay. Without reading it, do you, do you want to have a crack at answering that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Management. Okay. Um. Some sort of pricing power. Okay. Um, high switching costs. I mean, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's just go with those for the sake okay. of, for the sake of time. So they said, uh, huge marketplace. Yeah. Like total addressable market is huge. High barriers to entry. 
which gives it longevity. So yeah. you had that with switching costs. And then a very low level of capital employed. So yeah, yeah, yeah. they just generate heaps of free cash flow. Um, and they actually suggested that eBay could be the most valuable company in the world. And remember, they're writing at the time. Of they're writing Amazon? this in like the early 2000s. Yeah, right. And they were like, eBay has a huge marketplace. Um, you know, they uh, have high barriers to entry because of like the whole network effect. Um, and they're very capital light business. Did they invest in eBay? Probably. Yeah. Um, well, actually, no. They finished this quote with "perhaps we should own eBay as well." So right. maybe they didn't. But they were, they kind of nail hit the nail on the head. They just got the wrong company. Cause yeah, it was Amazon. It was Amazon. Amazon, yeah. huge market, high barriers to entry, very low cap- levels of capital employed. Um, wow. Not bad. Yeah, um, good on them. And so that then really defined their investing style. And they have this quote early in the piece, two thousand and four. Um, we often ask companies what they would do with windfall profits and most spend it on something or other or return the cash to shareholders. Almost no one replies, give it back to customers. How would that go down with Wall Street? Yeah, nice. But this, how it should go down with Wall Street is... Great. Well, these are the generate these... some unbelievable companies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe we could... Um, are there any other examples of companies that do give it back or is Costco their main kind of example and then Amazon? So they write about a number of others. So Costco, obviously, Amazon. Then they also write about Dell. Okay. Um, I feel like we kind of missed the first generation of computing yeah, stocks like IBM, HP, and, IBM, yeah, oh, yeah. And Dell. Um, yeah. But by the looks of it from their letters, Dell was had this philosophy and HP, which was um, Carly Fiorina was the... CEO at that time. She's now like the Republican. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, Southwest Airlines, they say Walmart is a good example. Yeah, yeah. Um, Geico Insurance. Um, so there's a few others that they found over the journey. Um, but I think Amazon for them was... Was the big, uh, the big, big dog. One. Yeah. yeah, nice. So, Ren, as you mentioned, um, I-, I had never heard of them. Um, what is it? 218-page letter? <laughs> or is that all of them? It's all the letters. Yeah, it's all the letters. From yeah. 2001, 2014. So, we will include the notes. And um, it's just a great reminder of how quality these letters are in terms of investing information and getting insight into how some of the best investors in the world think about uh, companies and and you know answer the question what is the most valuable company in the world yeah, yeah and I think there's it, it, they for me are a classic example of how you need to you don't need to have a contrarian insight on a business per se but you need to have some insight that the market is getting wrong and for them the key insight so this this whole scale economic shared was like the driver of their investing philosophy, but when it, when you look at it in the metrics, what that looks like is you know a, a profit margin that is getting smaller every year, um, and you know the like your return on equity and return on investor capital and and those metrics won't look particularly strong because what Wall Street what investors traditionally want to see is um, profit margins growing and that profit number getting bigger and you know, a business having operating leverage, so profit is growing faster than revenue. Like that, they're some of the things that traditionally you'd say, oh, this business has clearly got a moat. They've clearly got a competitive advantage and they're using that to grow their profit line. Um, but these guys flipped that on its head and they said, well, no, the source of competitive advantage is customer loyalty and having a having scale that, in, uh, that new entrants can't compete with you on price. And so, a lot of the metrics that they were looking for were the opposite of what the rest of the market were looking for. Mm. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Well, Ren, that does bring us to the end of our EM chat for Monday. But as we mentioned halfway through the episode, we are launching the dive this Wednesday. It's been a massive undertaking. It's our eighth podcast. It's going to be a massive show. We're really, really excited about it. We don't think there's anything quite like it in the market at the moment. And uh, we really hope that all you guys in the Equity Mates community and beyond will um, will will really enjoy it as well. Um, as you know, there are plenty of podcasts out there. So one thing we do ask you is for a small favor. If you can jump over now, rate it, review it, at least if it isn't out, subscribe to it. And then on Wednesday, once it does launch, give it a listen and give it a five-star review. It does really help out with uh, the charts and also... 
uh, getting in front of new listeners. So we would really appreciate your help on that. And uh, we really do hope you enjoy it. Appreciate your feedback as well. If you do want to hit us up with any feedback or questions, hit us up at contact at equitymates.com. Don't forget also that FinFest is coming in October. More information will be coming on that shortly, but you can register at finfest at equitymates.com slash finfest. But Ren, as always, really great fun to chat stocks and we'll pick it up next week. Sounds good. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.